two issues that I'd like to address. The whole issue about textbooks and then open courseware development. And in fact, the textbook issue dovetails very nicely into the other environment. So let me jump right into it. I'm going to take a bit of a theoretical approach uh, because I think it is very instructive to both environments. Think of the good old days of mimeographs when you had your wax paper on the drum and you printed copies that way. I remember still you doing that in the Navy, in the South African Navy in the early 80s. Um, photocopy machines took over. Technology in photocopy machines made it so that you could fax, scan, print, and, uh, and do your photocopying. So, uh, interesting way that made it really easy to do photo, to, to create copies. Um, so, it encouraged people to produce much of their own materials to their students because it was so easy. Um, then we interesting find that the whole virtual thing came about and as I looked at what I do today versus what was done to me as an undergrad student as an undergrad student I had to run to the coffee shop and buy a volume of paper with all the notes and articles and so forth today I put everything on the web I do not shuffle any paper at all anymore very interesting change in how things happen so that's the environment of the physical copy that we see this virtual thing is really possible now as we look at content I want to use the analogy quickly of the medical profession you had your doctor in the Middle Ages he was also the pharmacist um, the diagnosed you decided on medication produced the medication right then say so here you go herbal do uh, doctors in, in Africa the Sangomas still do that to this day diagnosis and medication from the same person that has changed in the Western world um, pharmacists then started doing the medication. Then pharmaceutical companies took that over and the pharmacists just became the gatekeepers of the medication and that's where we are today. Very interesting. So you still have your doctor doing the diagnosis, pharmacist, gatekeeper and the pharmaceutical company producing the actual medication. When it comes to textbooks we see the similar involvement of um, textbook companies like pharmaceutical companies running the show and pulling in who they need to write the textbooks and everybody uses this one person's textbooks and um, the, so it's an interesting similarity but the thing that we've got to deal with today that's very unique is the virtual space which there is no virtual space in the medical analogy um, they can't give you virtual medication it's a physical tangible thing whereas you can give information in a virtual space so that's a new dynamic that's added that takes our whole analogy to a, into a new dimension as we consider this Looking at pragmatics with textbook issues, I think we all understand that every situation is somewhat different and you have to make good judgment. The only thing that I really hope for is just one thing that I really hope you won't do as an educator is tell yourself, I'm busy with other stuff, so let me find a company that's done it all. They can, I want, what I want from you guys is I want a good textbook. I want all the exams and tests and then of course give me the, sh the answer sheet um, and, and let me plug in whatever I can into our course management system that I can just shovel it up there and let them do it. And I trust you guys, you better be good because my name is writing on this one. I really hope that's not what you do. That's kind of like what happened to the pharmacist, the pharmaceutical company tells them what they're going to be selling to the people. Um, fortunately there's choice and so in both cases with phar uh, pharmaceuticals and with uh, textbooks you have, do have choice so yeah you can jump from one to the other but there's a sense of abdication I feel at a, a university like ours it behooves us to not abdicate everything we can and to develop stuff on our own makes a lot of sense to stay current in the field and to remain the leaders in the field well this virtual space has opened up and the dimension that that has created is very interesting we now find that we can collaborate with other colleagues. There's the whole issue of open courseware that has opened up a whole new game. I'll talk about that in a minute. Let me conclude on the textbook stuff with just some practical examples of what you can do. The first question is, do you really need a textbook? And only you can answer that. And I hope it's not for convenience sake only that you make that decision. Um, I once spoke with a representative from a textbook company and he said to me, the unwritten rule is you have to sell them paper their business model is based on paper um, that's not maybe our learning model necessarily but that's their business model so they're gonna try and sell you paper whether it's really the best thing for learning or not it's not the issue it's the business model so we have to 
independently consider if paper really makes sense, especially as the new generation comes up with their total comfort with web learning and um, interacting through a screen rather than a book as the only means of real learning um, and the interactivity that a web can add to it that a book really doesn't do well at, there is some compelling reasons to consider alternatives. So you answer that question first, do I really need a textbook? And then um, you might hear some of the possibilities. If you do need a textbook, what I've done, for example, with the one, only one class that I use a textbook for out of the four that I teach, um, I carefully looked at the different editions and found that they just add new pictures, but it's basically the same textbook. Very little changes from one edition to the next. We're on version 11 right now, but all the way from version 7 is fine. So I give the, my students the ISBNs for all the versions and let them pick. I also give them a list of sites that they can visit, like adall.com and Amazon and many others, so that students can go and shop around for the best book. My book costs $90. My students often pick it up for less than 5 That makes me happy when I see that happen. So there are those cheaper alternatives that you can really, if you can just make it last. We've got the textbook rental program. If a te textbook lasts a little longer, then the rental process really works and there's a lot of savings that go, in, go into that. And finally, if you feel, to answer this question, it means I'll have to do a little homework. And that's what I really hope you'll do, is to go search out the resources out there. When I talk about open courseware, I'll open up some new avenues for you to search. And I think this is a topic that we really need to take on centrally at the university to come up with great resources that we can share with faculty that they in their specific disciplines that they can become aware of what's out there because things happen so fast and all over and we're not always up to date with everything out there. Busy life, busy research, got a book that works, why should I go mess and hunt for other things when I've got other, many other issues that I have to address. So I think some facilitation in that regard might be good. So I found for my other sites, for my other three classes that all my courses are web anchored I can pump a lot of um, links to, to other reputable environments to, to replace a textbook that has worked very well and many students have personally thanked me for that. So now let's move into the open courseware environment. I've been involved in this environment since about 2002 and I've developed uh, openlanguages.net which is a foreign language open courseware site at the moment specifically focused on African languages. Um, the important thing to look at here as we look at the as the world now stands is the fact that open courseware came about because there is a global community that communicate with each other without knowing each other personally but we have a sense of who we are in a bigger context within a community of practice and we know because of the web 2.0 connection that we can all contribute to a similar environment this has changed the world so what I really feel we need to look at as we move in, into the future with open courseware is what are the compelling reasons for doing this. I asked David Wiley um, to, to speak to my class recently um, and that is an open course as well that's on the web and I'll share with you the address as well that you can go and see how this environment works. Um, and I asked David this question, why would a university really bother with this? David had the following to say, he said, if you don't jump on it right now, you'll miss that opportunity of being a pioneer in the field. Do not wait till it's me too when you're in that phase because you will miss that opportunity for great name recognition in this field because this really is the future as the global community comes together and share in an open fashion. That's why open source um, software we notice is now serious. It's not some really hokey pokey stuff on the side for desperately poor people. It's mainstay. Many countries, many governments have localized to um, open uh, source um, operating systems and software like uh, Linux, um, OpenOffice and the likes. And it just keeps, keeps getting better and better. So this kind of a mindset is here to stay. And being part of that, I think, is something we really should take seriously. Two phases that I've noticed in open course redevelopment. When MIT did their first phase, Faculty were hesitant to put their syllabi online because they weren't up to date. So they would say, give me a few months, and they got their syllabi up to date and current, and then they gladly put it online. The blessing to MIT by doing that was the general level 
of their syllabi increased and improved and it blessed the whole institution. So as a phase one, just to put your syllabi in line, I think it's a wonderful idea. It blesses the institution. Um, then at a, a second phase is to consider the student population at large beyond your university and the interactivity that you would like to have in there. That makes a big difference if you have something that's open because you really know it's your name that's writing on that um, and you're not now relying on a textbook company's quality it's your quality that matters and so it, it compels people to do a good job I find that um, the work that I put out there it has really increased my ability to sense good quality and to make that difference myself the reasons that I um, offer for considering open course with number one students can see exactly what they're going to get um, they can go through, peruse the course from beginning to end and know exactly what's coming their way. By doing that, you allow others in. You also then will be able to access others that do the same thing. And that collaboration in sharing improves the quality all around. It creates a new spirit of not, it's I'm the important um, dog on the block, but the subject matter is important I gladly contribute what I can to improve the quality of the subject matter and others doing the same that collective effort I think is far more important than the insular individual efforts that the past has been known for so quality becomes transparent because before you could have poor quality and you could live your whole life as an educator and hide that fact because it's either in a book or it's behind protected behind a password and no one really knew whether it was good or not. By it being open, it really sets the stage to produce quality. Um, the branding. With quality comes good branding for either um, an institution or for a program. So another very valuable thing to consider. And um, I find that students really appreciate this for one simple reason. And this to me is a very compelling reason. And I'm still in... in in my infancy in developing this thought if you take a normal course you will notice that student, the semester starts students can populate the class whether it's face to face or online semester passes final exam go away we're done with you you've paid your dues we've given you the service gone with you now go on to something else that mindset now changes what we can do now is you can create a add on to an open course that those who've passed through can linger and there's a mentoring forum that you can create where those can uh, mentor those coming in so that students that really like the subject matter and want to stay attached to it you can put them in a mentoring forum where they can then interact with current students they might want to come back because guess what I'm not going to start all over next semester with a course I'm going to keep my existing course and just keep adding to it and making it better and as I do so and my second and third and fourth edition of the same course comes out, former students with great interest in the subject matter would love to come back and see what I've done and to stay current or even feed me with some great uh, tips um, about the course and make contributions. See the interesting community that it creates here. And so you do not necessarily lose your students that are moved on, but you still can retain their participation in this. So it's a whole new concept that it creates for us. And I feel it's a, something that's really worthwhile pursuing. And I think that we should really take a serious look at this and see how we can make a beginning. Make a start, but put it on the map. That this is something that is on the map for us, and how can we do it best. I hope these reflections have been of some value to you. Um, I encourage you to go to the web, search Open Courseware, do a search on that, and you'll hit Berkeley's uh, free education online site, you'll hit MIT site, you'll see Utah State University's OER, you'll see the sites in China and Vietnam, South Africa and all over popping up and the collaboration that there is in this community amongst these people across disciplines. Phenomenal collaboration is starting to take place and this is why I feel it's vital to be part of that. And then you'll also come the OER Commons. I think oercommons.org is a great site as well to get you started to understand the field and to be part of it. It's a very, by nature, collaborative, inclusive community. And if our institution were to decide to join it, I know we'll be very well received and we will get great mentoring from those that have learned from their own mistakes.
Thank you.